Okay, uh, welcome here to week four of payroll accounting. We are now ready to look at federal withholdings, and we'll also take a look at state withholdings as well. We're going to combine those two. The, uh, the text, for good reason, can't go into a lot of detail with states just because there would be 50 different rules or maybe more like about 41 in that uh, nine states don't even have income tax. Um, if you knew that the uh, Florida was one of them that doesn't have it, Nevada, there are a few others that don't have the payroll tax. And we're actually going to do a discussion board on that um, in, a, in a couple of weeks, so uh, you'll get a little bit more in-depth about the uh, state and how states are a little different. But before we go, let's uh, quick review over things we definitely need to remember from our FICA taxes and everything in Chapter 3. Which uh, form is filled out quarterly for the FICA and federal? Remember, so these two you file together, uh, two different types of taxes, of course. But we're going to file a 941, that's the form, 941, uh, at the end of every quarter. When are the FICA and federal deposits made? Remember, it's typically um, every month that you will have to make these. If you are a large, a larger employer with quite a bit of employees that have a lot of taxes taken out, you will have to be more of a bi-weekly. <coughs> and if you make over 100,000, or if you have over 100,000 in liability taxes, then you will have to make a payment then by the next day. So it all depends, and remember how it depends. It, it's based on your look back period. And we went over that um, last time. And it's over a, a 12 month period from July 1 up to June 30th. And it's based on if you've had at least, if you've had under 50,000 in total payroll taxes paid. If you had under that, then you're going to be a monthly. If you had over that, you will be a uh, bi weekly. Definitely want to know the percentages for Social Security and Medicare. Remember, Social Security is 6.2%. Medicare is 1.45%. Who um, or which, which one of these has a limit? If any of them, it is the Social Security. And for this current year, what we're using is 118500 That number does change uh, on a yearly basis due to the cost of living. It usually goes up about 3000 every year, give or take a little bit. However, the percentages usually don't change. Who pays the FICA taxes? Remember, that's both the employee and the employer pay. They both chip in the same amount, and then the employer pays both uh, monies to the government. What kind of payments are not taxed for FICA? There are a few items. Like when you earn money and some of it's put away for medical premiums, that's income that's not taxed. Or if you put money away into an FSA or HSA account, which is there to pay your medical bills, not taxed. Another uh, one, common one, is dependent care. There are a few other items that are not going to be taxable, especially if the employer pays them. If the employer pays for you to go to school up to a certain amount, a uh, certain dollar limit, that's tax free. Um, if the employer chips into your retirement account or pays for some of your medical premiums, that's tax free as well. So things you would always want to take advantage of when looking for a new job. Okay, let's go down here and a quick overview of this payroll register. We always start with our what our wages were, and we're going to really um, uh, expand that out here next week when we look at uh, week five. Uh, we're going to not only look at the gross wage, but we're going to see, well, what's, how much of that gross wage is actually taxable? And what's going to be taxable is different for Social Security than what is for federal withholding sometimes, all because of a big common item, which is the retirement withholdings. And we're going to talk about that here in just a little bit. So with this individual, with them um, earning 10000 and they had already earned 1163 if we would add 10000 to the 1163 that's taken us way over the cap for Social Security, the cap being 1185 for this year. So then we have to figure out how much money is left that still needs to be taxed. And the only amount remaining is 2,200 of that 10,000 that we're going to tax at 6.2%. So 
So that's how I got this $134.40, taking that $2,200 times the 6.2%. However, I take the entire 10,000 because Medicare has no cap and times it by 1.45%. The second individual down here doesn't meet the cap by any means. They're only at 50,000 income. So the entire 5,000 is taxed at both percentages. And then when we journal, we show how much the employee, the employees actually earned. Remember, we do this as one big journal entry for all the employees together. And then simply add up um, all, where the different monies are going to. Out of this 15444 is going to Social Security. 217 is, ah, itches. 217 is going to uh, Medicare. And then the rest of the money, the 14338 is going to the employee's pocket. And then finally, um, the employer has to pay their share of payroll tax. The Social Security and Medicare portion, which is exactly the same as the employee. So they have to pay an additional sum, and that's out of the employee's pocket, therefore it's called an expense. So you can, the first part here of this chapter, I, I show you that um, how big the tax code has gotten, and that's why uh, some people have begun to think, well, is it maybe a more a flat tax or what's known as a fair tax? possibly a better idea instead of having over 73,000 pages of tax tax code and 4,000 pages and forms. Is that a bit excessive? Maybe. All right, so um, we go down here, a couple, couple items to, rem to know. If you're a statutory employee, there are a few um, people in this category. Statutory employees do not have federal taxes taken out, but, so therefore they do, in a way, count themselves as self-employed, but they do have FICA taxes taken out, which is a great benefit. Because if you don't have FICA taxes taken out, that means you have to pay it yourself. And when you pay it yourself, not only do you pay your portion the, as the employee, but you also pay the employer's portion. So that's never good and you have to pay both. And then, as a, however, as a real estate person, you are considered self-employed, and you have to pay not only your federal taxes, but your FICA taxes as well. And the FICA taxes, as I just said, include the employer's portion, so you're paying double what a typical employee would pay. Here are some um, items that are specifically outlined in the, in the code that are not taxed for federal withholdings and really aren't taxed for FICA in that case either. So they aren't taxed at all. First one here, de minimis items. This would be if you used your company's fax machine. Um, yes, that would normally cost you if you had to go and do that somewhere else and you got the benefit of it for free, so really you are getting a benefit. If it was, if they were going to tax every single penny, you would be taxed on the value of that fax. But, of course, that would be very tough to keep track of. So they say any small items that you get advantage of, they're going to keep them, they're going to write them off and, and not, not have anything added to your income. No additional cost services. This is only for the business that you are in. If your business has many different facets, uh, they do some hardware, maybe software, or if your company does some um, airline travel and some hotel travel, I, don't, I mean, different things. If you're in the airline business, then you would be able to get a free flight if it didn't cost the, your employer anything else, meaning they didn't give up a seat, uh, that your one extra person didn't require them to have extra fuel or whatever it would be. Um, then you could get it for free. But if your business has two different options, or more than two, and you were in the airline and they also had a hotel business as well, you wouldn't qualify then for the hotel side of things. It has to be in your line of work. Qualified discounts, you can read through that. Generally, 20% off is considered a tax-free. You don't have to pay any taxes on that if you get a, a, an extra 20%. 
Reduced tuition. This is for an employee of a college or a university. So if you're an employee and your son, daughter, or other kind of relative that you have as a dependent goes for free, maybe a spouse, you don't have to pay tax on that as obviously that's a great benefit to you. You would normally have had to pay, so that would technically have been income that you have received by getting a free service, but they are writing that off. The IRS says we, are, we do not tax on that. And then this is the only difference between these two is on the second one here, your employer is not a college or university, and they simply pay for you to go to school. And as long as they pay for less than $52.50 a year, then none of that money that they have paid to the schooling is taxable to you. And then a couple of the others, retirement plans, if the government kicks in any money, not the government, your employer kicks in any money to one of these three retirement medical plans, which would be your premiums or health savings type plan, um, or FSA, you, um, of course, you would not pay any uh, taxes on the money that the employer paid for your benefit. If you want to get a full list of all the items, go to this site here, this IRS publication site, and it has a, um, in great detail a lot about each one of these and, and some other ones that I don't have listed here. Uh, a couple examples of some taxable things that if your company does provide these to you, they will be taxed to you if they provide a benefit, like this one here. If the company uh, pays for your membership into a country club, you're in a high-end type business and they go ahead and take care of the country club, uh, maybe they're a close affiliate of the country club, that actually, that, those, due, those dues prices would be added into your income and you would have to pay tax on that benefit, even though you never received the cash. <clears throat> Specific payments. These are otherwise exempt from federal and FICA purposes. <clears throat> um, of course, we would hope that this one would be, even if you get the money ahead of time, the IRS says that doesn't really matter. If you're getting reimbursed, either ahead of time or after, the reimbursements would not be taxable. Anything over than that would be. Um, note here, a deceased person's wages. So if somebody is working and then all of a sudden they, they die, when that person gets their final check, they will not have federal taxes taken out. However, they do still have FICA taxes taken out of their final check that goes to the estate. Um, if the employer provides you um, dependent daycare, that's great. If the employer provides you parking up to 250 a month, you get that free of tax. Usually if, uh, a lot of employers will have a group life insurance plan, and as long as the value of that plan is under 50000 you get that as a tax-free benefit. This is a, a nice one that I actually took advantage of several years ago, not for Ivy Tech, but for another uh, company. Qualified moving expenses, if the company reimburses you for your moving expenses, you do not to, to start a new job at that company. That is not taxed, so that's a great benefit, dollar for dollar reimbursed. Uh, skip down here to number 10, payments for a workman's comp. Some of you may have actually received this at some time in the past. And if you have, you'll note that you didn't have any taxes taken out, which is a great thing. You're getting your, your pay or at least something nearly equivalent, hopefully, and no taxes are taken out. It's just a little bit of a, a perk, not a perk, but uh, a way to help you out a little bit when you're injured. Cafeteria plan. So all of those items above were, were generally things that the employer could provide to you and it's not taxable to you. These cafeteria plans are things that you can provide to yourself and they're not taxable to you. So you take them out of your check and you're not going to be 
taxed on it. And with some of these, you have the benefits to get cash benefits and then go and do your own thing somewhere else. However, if you get the tax equi or the cash equivalent, you are taxed on those. If you choose to get the cafeteria plan, which is the qualified plans, the value that you take out of your paycheck is tax-free. So most people go ahead and do that cafeteria plan and go with the tax-free option. Dependent care, premiums for health insurance, flexible spending. Note here, um, some of you know this, that if you put money away into a flexible spending account to pay for your upcoming medical bills, you have to estimate. You have to look back at prior years, think ahead to this year if you have any big expenses possibly coming up, and decide how much money do I want to put away. Because if I don't put away nearly enough, then I'm not taking advantage of the tax-free uh, plan. If I put away too much, I actually lose my money. So that's a, a downside. Here are the, uh, the caps for how much you can put away in a year. And notice they do go up slightly every year. And then you may ask, well, what if I do put away too much and I don't use it? What happens to that money if it's forfeited? Typically, it's used to pay for those administrative expenses because your employer, if they have an FSA type of account, they'll have it set up with some bank. And that bank isn't going to handle this, this, um, this, this uh, business for you free of charge. They charge the company, whoever they are, say it's Ivy Tech, they're going to charge Ivy Tech a set rate, and then they say, yeah, we'll take care of all of your FSA payments coming in and going out for this fee. And that's any money that you have left over that doesn't get used. Typically, the, your employer would use that to offset some of the costs in the plan. Health savings account, it's just um, a little It's a little different than the flexible spending. They're both used for the same thing, to pay for health care expenses. The big difference between a, with an HSA is you don't lose your money. If you put away 3000 and you only spend two, that's that's okay. You you keep your extra 1000 and grow interest on it at a very, very small rate um, into the next year. And the reason they, they do that is health savings accounts are only eligible for people with high deductibles. So it's a little bit harder to guess uh, exactly how much you're going to need. And you need... You, you will have quite a few expenses that aren't paid for, especially up front. Um, the deductibles has to be at least at a very bare minimum 1300 or 2600 for a family. And a lot of times they're going to be uh, higher than that. And then you're allowed to put away up to uh, tax-free, if you're a family, up to $6,650. One of the key differences, the, probably the biggest difference between federal and FICA, if you don't get much out of this lecture except for this one point, then at least you will have gotten them one of the most important things, is payments into the employee retirement account are not taxed. Payments that the employee puts away out of their own money into a 401k are not taxed for federal purposes. However, they are taxed for FICA purposes. So when I said at the very beginning of this lecture that you could have taxable wages for FICA that are different than federal, this is the reason why, and one of the biggest reasons why. And we're going to do a couple examples of this to show how that works here in just a few minutes. So if you had 40000 in gross income, and then you had uh, say 3000 in retirement money being withheld, your gross, your actual, I should say gross, your taxable wages for federal purposes would only be 37000 You're only being taxed on 37000 when you really made forty, because three of that you never saw and it went to your 401k. However, for FICA purposes, your taxable amount is still forty. They don't take off for the retirement money like federal does. <clears throat> Notice how much you're allowed to put away for a 401k, up to 17500 
that number does um, change, not necessarily every year, but it changes maybe at least once every four or five years. And then you're allowed an extra catch-up, they call it, catch-up period. If you are at least age 50, you can put in an additional 5500 into your retirement account. So there's a retirement account that your employer sponsors, which is generally called a 401k or a 403b. And then there's something that you can set up yourself called an IRA or an individual retirement account. You can put away, notice the big difference. In the 401k, you could put away 17500 In an IRA, it's cut drastically down to only 5500 for the year 2015. Or if you're over 50 or older, you can put away an additional thousand to put you up to 6,500. So, with the, one of the big differences besides the amount that you're allowed to put away, so it's a lot less, is with an IRA, you actually deduct the amount that you paid in on your 1040. That's because your employer is going to include that that amount that you put into the IRA in your taxable benefit, in your taxable income. Because they don't know that you put it into an IRA. They don't know what you did with your money. Therefore, you take it out later when you file your taxes on the 1040 and show that you had a reduction of income that's actually taxable. To be able to participate in an IRA, it's, it's, um, it's a little bit, it's all, it's geared for those who don't have a company access to a 401k. So if you don't have access and your company doesn't have a 401k, you can, doesn't matter how much you make, you can put in up to 5500 and take that off of your income. If your company does have a uh, 401k retirement plan or something similar, and even if you choose not to, it doesn't matter. It's just simply does the company have it offered to you. If they do, you can still do an IRA if your AGI is less than 60. If you, you can do in both, and it's not a problem. If your AGI is between 60 and 70, then you're going to start to have what's called a phase out. So instead of being able to put in the full 5,500, you're going, to have, you're going to put in something a little bit less. If you're over 70,000, then you can't put any money away. Notice the limit is a little higher for those that are married. It's not quite double, which um, some I don't really understand you know, why. Most items that you'll come across in taxes, not all of them, but a lot of them, the amount will be doubled from what the single or head of household rate was. So single started at 60. A lot of times the married would start at double that, which makes sense to people coming together, it should be doubled to 60, but it's not always the case. So your phase out starts at 96 and goes to 116. <clears throat> so this is how we do a uh, calculation for phase outs. The, the way that I show it here is slightly different than the way the book does it. However, my way has one less step, though, than the book does as well. So I, that's why I go ahead and show you my way here. It's, it's very close to the book but it does allow you one less step, which is, I think, always a good thing, one less chance for a mistake. So if you are in between, let's say you're single and you are in between this phase out, this is what you need to do. So you take that top number, and we're going to go through this with this little example that I have. Take the top number, 70,000, and subtract it from your AGI, which you see on your tax return, 66,000. And then we need to, so that's 4,000, and then divide it by the phase-out span. And what I mean by the span is how much difference is there in between the bottom and the top number. So there's a $10,000 difference. 4,000 divided by 10, what that is telling me now is I'm allowed to take and deduct 40% of what I typically would have been allowed at 100% if I didn't have any phase-out. So I'm typically allowed 5,500, but with me being in the phase-out limit, I can only deduct 40% of that 5,500, thus 
2200 I'm allowed to deduct off of my 1040 for income. So if I had made 71000 the amount that I would have been able to deduct on my return would have been zero because I was over the cap, over the phase out. So that's an IRA. You actually get to deduct money when you uh, pay it in. And then when you take the money back out, which we discuss a whole lot more in tax class, you are taxed on it at that point for federal purposes, not FICA, because you are already taxed on it for FICA purposes when you earned it. The big difference between a IRA and a Roth IRA, with a Roth IRA, more people can, can use this because the, the caps are much higher. However, the, the good or bad thing, the way you want to look at it, the bad thing up front is you don't get any deductions for the Roth IRA. You put money aside, but you're still paying tax on it, FICA and federal, right now. The good part is when you take the money out, then you're not paying taxes on it. So when you retire and you're age 70, say, and then you take out 3000 every month, you're not paying any tax on that money, or are you paying tax on any of the earnings, which is a, the big benefit. With an IRA, you're paying tax on that 3000 that you put in, and you're going to pay tax on your earnings. With the Roth IRA, you paid the taxes up front, therefore they give you the earnings free or tax free. Notice the phase out limit is quite a bit higher. Pretty much doubled, almost doubled. All right, let's look at a couple examples and see how this phase out works. With our retirement example, we got an individual here who is 60 years old, married, does not have a qualified retirement plan with her employer. Her AGI is 185000 How much can she contribute to an IRA? Well, anybody can contribute to an IRA. What the question is, and what I should have put is, how much can she contribute and deduct to, a, to an IRA? How much can she con contribute and deduct, and I should even put that even more if if applicable, which would be for the IRA only. How much can she deduct for an IRA and Roth IRA? Well, she does not have a qualified retirement plan with her employer. That's key. That tells me right then that her AGI does not matter. So she would be allowed to deduct 6500 6, off of her taxes. For the Roth IRA, she is limited because of that phase out. So the phase out, it doesn't matter if you have an IRA or not, it's just there for everybody. Remember the phase out for the IRA was only there if you had a qualified retirement plan option at your work. Roth IRA doesn't have such a qualifier, it just says everybody has this phase out. So again, we take the top number in the phase out which was 191, subtract out our current AGI, so that leaves 6,000, 6 over 10 is 60 percent, we are allowed to put into a Roth IRA 60 percent of the, of the 6,500 that I would normally have been allowed. Now I'd like for you to try number two on your own, see how you do. Uh, pause this lecture and then unpause it when you get it done and, and here in just a few seconds I'm going to go through the answer. Okay, so we got a 45 year old individual single, that's going to be key, that's our age, that's, that's telling us we get the lower end of the amount that's, that's uh, possibly allowed. He does have the option at work to have a qualified plan. It it's, doesn't matter if he, if he does it or not. If he takes it, I should say, takes advantage of it or not. His AGI is 68000 How much could he contribute to an IRA? 
Well, if we go back up to the, the limits for an IRA with somebody who has the option, it's 60 to 70,000. So he's almost ineligible, but he can do a little bit with a, with a um, limit with an AGI of 68,000. So we take the top number, 70,000, minus his AGI, which is 68. We're left with a 2,000 difference, 2,000 over the span of 10,000 equals only 20%. We are allowed a deduction then of $1,100. As for the Roth, <clears throat> I can do the full amount. I am nowhere near, well, I'm getting close, but I'm still not near the bottom number of the Roth phase out, so I can deduct all 5,500. Okay, same with number three. Go ahead and pause this and then come back when you're done and I will go through the answers here in just a few moments. Okay, with this one, the age here is 55. That's going to come into play. That's going to push us up into the second um, tier of being able to put in more money. Single has the option of participating in a qualified retirement plan. It doesn't matter if she chooses to or not. Her AGI is 117. How much could she contribute to an IRA? IRA, she wouldn't even be able to contribute anything. Her AGI is well over the $70,000 cap. If she has the option, if, if she did not have the option at work, then she could have contributed to the IRA. No problem. There is no cap number. But since she had the option, she cannot do an IRA. Roth IRA, we need to go up and look at our phase-out numbers for somebody who is single. It's 114 to 129. So we are in that phase-out. So we will, we will be able to deduct. Some, we will be able to put in some into an IRA, just not able to put all 6,500 into it. And let's look at those answers. Hundred twenty nine, the top dollar amount minus what we had earned, so twelve thousand over the span. We're still allowed to contribute eighty percent of the sixty five hundred. Now, what I want to look at is an example to determine how much am I going to be um, taxable on for basically with all of my deductions that I have going on. So I want us to first off tell when I go and calculate my FICA taxes, the Social Security and Medicare, how much am I going to tax by 6.2 percent in 1.45? And how much am I going to have to look up for federal withholdings? That's what we're going to do next after this example. We're going to actually see well, I know how much taxable money I, ha I, I have now. How much do I need to pay? <clears throat> so we'll take a uh, couple minutes, pause, and go through this and try to, try to um, get an answer of how much do you think is going to be taxable for each of these? And then tell me what his net pay is. Okay, so for this one, we have a gross salary of 1500 but for FICA purposes, I, I'm not taxed on the 150 for medical premiums, so that takes me down to 1350 I'm not taxed, um, actually I am, I don't get to take out 100 for FICA purposes, I will when I do the federal next, but for FICA I do not do anything with this, so I'm still at 1350 Union dues, I don't do anything with that for any for any of these items. That's going to be fully taxable. A hundred for flexible spending, I can deduct that for for both um, FICA and federal. So that takes me down to from thirteen fifty to twelve fifty. And a hundred dollars for HSA contributions, that takes me down to eleven fifty. It tells me here how much as well that the employee, the employer pays in for the retirement and HSA. 
for, for this purpose right here, that's just extra information. I don't pay tax on the amount that the employer pays into those accounts. Because that's considered a tax free. And then 150 for child support, that's not deductible. Thus, for FICA purposes, I'm allowed to deduct, I'm, allowed, I'm going to be taxed on, I should say, $1,150. Again, how I got that right here. And then you'll notice the difference with the federal withholdings. So with the FICA, I was able to deduct the premiums, the dependent daycare, and the HSA. Same items for the federal, except I get to add one extra item, which is the retirement money. I'm not going to be taxed on the $100 I put away for retirement. So finally, my net pay. The $1,500 minus the premiums, minus the money I put away for retirement, minus the union dues, the uh, HSA, the dependent care, child support. Now I start even taking out my taxes. So $1,150 times 6.2%, that's where I get the 71.3. $1,150 times 1.45%. And then I tell you how much federal withholding is because we haven't looked at that, how to do that yet. And then how much money is, what is the percent of total pay? Well, if you're, if you're like me, that kind of makes you sick to even think about it sometimes. All you do is take the 672 and divide it by 1500. So this person's getting under 50% of what they make, which may not may or may not be that far off from a real life example. Okay, let's look at Actually, I think that'll be a, a good place. I'm going to cut this lecture into two parts just because it's, it can be a little maybe overwhelming at first. So I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to stop this one here. Um, ah, I mixed that. Let's, let's just keep going. Let's keep going. Withholding allowances. So how much do we need to take out for federal withholding? Well, the first component after knowing what our taxable income is for federal is to know how many allowances are we going to be claiming. And allowances are closely related to how many dependents are you claiming. <clears throat> so one of the things we have to get um, familiar with is the Form W-4. And I have a copy of that in Blackboard for this week. And I would highly encourage you to bring that up at this point so you can um, follow along when we go through a few of these items. <clears throat> so the W-4 is going to tell the employer how many allowances you have, which is a rough simulation to your exemptions, but definitely not the same. Notice with the W-4, at any time you can change it, but you can't change it retroactive. So you, if you change it in April, it doesn't go back and, and change your February and March items. It only changes from April on. And then if you need to change it again in July for whatever other reason that's happened, not a problem, you can do that. The only problem might be your HR company, your HR people getting mad at you. But you're allowed to do it through IRS. <clears throat> if you don't fill out a W-4, the employer is going to um, take out taxes based on you being single and with zero allowances. That's the absolute most that they're going to take out. If you are single with zero allowances, that means you basically don't even have to take care of yourself, um, they're going to take out the most taxes. <clears throat> using the W-4 to determine the ideal number. So what we're going to do here is using this example, I want us to go through the W-4 and determine how much, how many exemptions should we put on this W-4. So at this time, I'm going to I'm going to pull up the W-4 form, and 
like for you to do that as well. I know you're not going to be able to see this. I don't want to go back and forth. So for just a few uh, minutes here, you, you will see mostly a black screen, I know. But I've got the W4 up, and I'm looking at the middle area. The very bottom is what you actually fill out as the employee. Put in your name, social security number. Uh, a very important part is your filing status down in box in, in area three. Not necessarily your filing status, but what you what you are, uh, your marriage or not. Um, and then line five is very important in telling how your employer how many uh, allowances you're going to have. Line six is if you want some extra money taken out. Uh, specifically, you want $10 per check taken out just because you definitely don't want to have to pay uh, come year end when you file your taxes. That's one way you could do it. And then line seven, if you know you're not going to have to pay any taxes because you made under 10000 if you're single, you're going to have under 20000 if you're married, you can write exempt on line seven and not have any taxes taken out. So now I'm going back up to the middle of the page, and we're going to um, answer these questions based on my brief little example that I had. Pull that back up in the box. We have a married couple, a spouse works full time, we, and we'll assume they make about the same amount of money each. Two kids, both of them are under 16, and the couple makes about 50000 so using this information, let's go through and determine how many allowances this person typically should claim. So they're going to put one here in box A, one for yourself. And then box two, enter one if you are single and have one job. Nope. You are married and have one job and your spouse doesn't work. Nope. Your wages from a second job or your spouse wages are less than 15. Nope. So we don't put anything in there for B. Enter one in for your spouse, but you could choose zero. Um, so we'll go ahead and put in one for our spouse. So A and C both have one. Enter the number of dependents. So we'll have two dependents. D will be two. Enter one if you're head of household. Nope. Enter one if you have at least 1900 in dependent and child care expenses. It doesn't say that, so we'll say no. Child tax credit. This is why I put in the wage information. If your total income will be less than 61000 90000 if married, that's us. Enter two. Okay, so we enter two for box F. And then finally H, or actually uh, box G would be two, not F, G. We would have filled out and had six allowances. One for the individual, one for the spouse. Two for line D, the dependents and two for line G, taking care of the child tax credit. So down at the bottom in the W-4 on line five, we would put in six as the amount of allowances. <coughs> so the amount of allowances, every allowance that you take is going to reduce, is going to reduce your federal income amount by 39.50 for the entire year. Because that's how much of a exemption you get when you file your 1040 at the end of every year or to be in February or so. For every individual you claim on your taxes, you get to take off 39.50 of, uh, of taxable income. When you're filing your when you're filing your uh, W-4. The employer does not have to and will not verify your allowances, so you could put really any number you wanted to, but just know that if you put too high of a number, you won't have enough taxes taken out, and then you will owe come when it's time to do the 1040. So I, again, I talk about the writing the exemption on line 7. I just talked about that. You can go through that again if you would like. Notice that this has to be done if you do claim an exemption. You have to do that every single year. Anything else on the W-4 stays the same, but if you claim the exempt, that you're exempt from paying taxes, you have to refile that every year.
the other part there with line six, if you need extra money, because maybe you're getting money elsewhere that's not going to be have money taken out. Let's say you have an interest account and you're going to get an extra six, uh, I don't know, a pretty large amount, maybe $2,000 in extra income, and you know that's coming and you're going to be taxed on it, therefore you might end up owing. You could go to your employer, fill out a new W-4 and say, I'd like to plan ahead and go ahead and take out $10 of money out of my check every, every week in addition to what you normally would do. You fill out the same item with uh, when you start your retirement and it's time to take money out. Instead of calling it a W-4 though, they call it a W-4P for basically like your pension or profit sharing plan. So once the employers know your federal taxable income and they know the number of allowances, now they can easily determine how much money to take out of your check. If you open your book to the very back in one of the last um, appendices, there's an appendix, appendix P, the very back of the book, not just the end of the chapter, but the back of the book. There's an appendix T. The first three pages are we're going to use if if the um, if our wages in our in the items that are past the first three pages do not cover that. If if you make too much money and those and those charts don't help you because they don't go that high, then we have to use this percentage method on the front few pages. You'll notice there like on T2, it gives you the amount of allowances that you're allowed to take off of your taxable income. And then on the next page, it gives you the different ways that you're paid. Are you paid weekly, bi-weekly, semi-monthly, uh, monthly, and then keep going all the way up to yearly you could be paid. And we're going to go through some of these at this time. Now one thing that I do want you to know is the difference between a, a marginal tax rate and your average tax rate. Your marginal tax rate is just a clear cut number of where your income falls within a broad span. So if you look at that page, I think it's T3 on the, the first part of that appendix. And we'll just pick any one of the um, categories. It doesn't matter at this point. They're all going to have the same numbers or the, the same marginal rates. Let's say you just pick the first one where you're paid weekly and if you're single. And then you'll see income after allowances. If it's between uh, zero and a certain amount, you're going to pay 0%. And then 10%, 15%, 25 28 all the way up to 39.6% is what um, are the, your marginal rates. So your marginal rates are, if you made one more dollar, how much would that dollar be taxed at? That would be your marginal rate. You're going to pay tax at, say, 25%. Your average rate will almost always be lower than your marginal. Because even though you are in the 25% tax bracket, let's say, um, not every one of your dollars is taxed at 25%. The first few dollars that you make every year are taxed at the very lowest percent, 10%, just like anybody else who only made that much. And then once you get, once you start earning into the next category, those dollars are taxed at 15%. So not all of your money is taxed at whatever the highest rate you're in. Therefore, your average rate will almost always be lower than your marginal rate. So let's look at an example of how to do um, and to look up your uh, using those those brackets. So this uh, this example here with uh, somebody who is biweekly paid biweekly and they are single. And after I've taken out their deductions. So they, maybe they had gross wages of 3,500 every bi-weekly, but after taking out some of the deductions, they're down to 3,000 taxable income. We have noted that they have two allowances, 
they are single, determine the federal withholding, determine the marginal rate and the average rate. All right, so let's look at the long method. 3,000, and notice in the charts, or, or in, that, in that first page, T3, it says your taxable income after your allowances deduction. Well, if this person is paid bi-weekly, we look at the, the first page, T2, and for every allowance it says, if you're paid bi-weekly, you need to subtract $151.90 from your uh, income. And then if you have two allowances, times it by two. So after we take 3000 and subtract out that almost just a little over $300, I'm down now to what I'm going to look at in the chart of 2696. <coughs> so 2696, and I find where that income range falls. And I got to make sure I'm on the right chart down there. I find the bi-weekly one. The first one is weekly, so it's not definitely the first one. Go down and find bi-weekly, and then make sure you're on the single side. The single side is the left-hand side. So I find 2696 where that would fall in those ranges and then go to the very end of that line. So it says, okay, 2696 and at the very end it says in excess or minus with a little dash, 1506. And I want to subtract that off of my taxable wages. So after I subtract that out, I have 1190 left and I'm going to multiply that now, working now from right to left, we're going to work backwards. So we went all the way to the right-hand side, subtracted out 1506, and now start working back to the left. Multiply that by 25%, and then whatever you get, which in this case was 297.55, add in 195.40. So this individual is going to have $492 taken out of their check. Each, each time a check is issued. So we're in the 25, 25th percent percentile in marginal rate, or 25%, not percentile. 25, um, our tax rate. Our average rate, if we're paying $492.95 out of the 3000 that we earned that's taxable, I'm paying 16.4%. So our average rate is lower than our marginal. Okay, we're going to um, go through these last few examples, two, three, four, and then we're going to call it a day. And the second half here will be in week five when we talk about the W-2s and doing a lot longer examples. But let's finish out here with uh, these last couple lecture examples. <coughs> This uh, example here, this individual is paid bi-weekly. They're single and they have $2,010 of taxable federal withholding. So that's our taxable, um, taxable income. Two allowances determine the federal withholding using both the long method, the one I just showed you how to do, and using the tables. So we're going to want to make sure we have the right table looking at that we're looking at the right pay period, like a bi-weekly, and that the individual is single. And let's also determine the, um, the marginal and average tax rate. So pause it at this time, go through those, see what you get, and then we'll check your answers. Okay, using the long rate, I take the, the taxable income, 2010, and then this person is, uh, again, a bi-weekly, so we use that 151.90 number again, times it by two, because we have two allowances. So the 2,000 minus the little over $300 leaves us looking for where does 1706 fall into play. It actually is in the same bracket as the last person. It's just they're going to have a lot less tax at that 25% bracket. 
So the 1706 minus the 1506 leaves us just over $200 at 25%. So that, our last $200 was, we're going to pay taxes at 50 bucks on that, so it's kind of high. Plus 195 leaves us with $245 that we're paying in federal income tax. Thus, we're in the 25, 25th um, marginal rate is our, is our tax rate. However, we're really only paying 12.2% in total. If I looked at the tables, <clears throat> they give me 246, so it's a whole lot quicker and easier than getting this $245.45. What's your example three? With this one, what I want us to do is put in here how much are we going to be taxed for FICA, how much are we going to be taxed for federal withholding, what's our taxable wages, and then let's fill out this payroll register and determine our final net pay. So we're going to have taxable uh, pay that this is going to be some information we're going to need to use to determine these, these taxes, the tax rates that we need to take out. And then also, of course, taking out these extra items from my paycheck. So let's go ahead and hit pause, go through this, and then let, we can determine what the answer is. What I did with this one, first thing here is getting our FICA taxes. So we have 1200 is in taxable income. And how I got that was taking the 1450 gross, subtracting out the 150 in medical premiums, and the 100 in dependent um, care. I do not get to take out for FICA purposes the 100 for the retirement money. The only difference with the federal withholding is you do get to take out the 100 extra for retirement money. So that's why it's just a little bit lower. So our gross income of 1450 subtracting out how I got this 7440, I took 1200 times 6.2%. .2 I took 1200 times 1.45% 1 to get Medicare. And then I simply went to the back of the book in the appendix and I used the actual tables, no need to use the percentages and do it the long way. We can look up $1,100, somebody paying bi-weekly who is single, two allowances, and it comes out to be $90 should, you should withhold. And then finally subtracting out the three other items leaves us with a paycheck $918.20. The last item that I want to cover before we finish today is very similar to what we just did. The biggest difference now is we have made quite a bit of money so far this year. And we're very close to the Social Security cap. So that's why instead of just having a FICA taxable I've now broken it down and to say what, how much is going to be taxable for Social Security, Medicare, and federal withholdings. All three of them are going to have a different taxable income. So pause it, see what you get, and then we'll finish out this lecture by uh, looking at the answer. For Social Security, we would have typically had $7,500, $7,550 to be taxed. But if I put $7,550 and added it into what I already had earned, $116,700, that puts me way over the cap. Thus, I am only going to be taxed on the difference between the top Social Security number and how much I've already earned and it was taxable for Social Security. So the, on, the difference here is I only am going to be taxed at $1,800 for Social Security purposes. So I'm going to take the $1,800 and times it by 6.2%.
if I had another paycheck after this, so taxable Social Security would end up being zero. Medicare, I use the full 775.50. Adding in the bonus, subtracting out our two items that does not include the 401k. So for Medicare, I take the full 75.50 times it by 1.45%. The only difference with federal withholding is we do get to take out the 401k, the retirement money. We have taxable income of 7,200. That does not fall within our chart ranges, so we do have to use the long method. This individual was paid, uh, go back up, I believe it was semi-monthly. Yep, semi-monthly. So we look at the semi-monthly amount on P2. Three allowances, so take 7,200 minus what that is. 6706, make sure we look now to the correct category. This individual, go back up, married. So we need to go to the semi-monthly um, part of that bracket and look up on the right-hand side as the married side. Find where 6706 falls in. It's just into that next 28% bracket category. So we subtract out the 65.54 that it tells us. Only $152 are taxed at that, at that highest rate that we're in. And then add in the 1205, and that's where I get the $1,247 for federal withholding. Notice the charity does not come off and is going to be taxable for all of our wage types. Finally, we're left with a net income of 5581 The one thing that I did want to mention here before we're done is once I have found these numbers, the 7550, 7200, 1800, I no longer use those once I have determined how much taxes to take. When I'm going to fill out the, um, the paycheck, I go back to the original gross amount and that's what I use not the 7550. That was only to get how much taxes were taken out. This was a little bit longer lecture than um, typical, but this is pretty uh, important stuff, new stuff. And at this point, we will end it for week four, and I'll see you back for week five.